Welcome to Pod Save the World. I'm Tommy Vitor. I'm Ben Rhodes. Ben, did President Biden just have the most newsworthy ice cream stop in the history of ice cream stops? <laughs> yeah. um, yes, I can't. I can't quite remember one quite like that. I was. Uh, I DM Seth Myers. I was like, I uh, way to stick it to the White House press corps. You're like, you know, I'm going to interview this guy. I was and thinking that. I was, I, I was thinking OTR. that. Like, you don't usually <laughs> think you're going to make massive news no. on a uh, on a late night show and. Certainly not a late night show OTR, but uh, yeah. I guess he did. He's sitting there like, what? I thought we were just like. I don't think around. Seth, I don't think he expected to get that answer. No, uh, no, I don't think he did either. Yeah. But it was a really interesting interview. And I was, you know, he pressed him hard on like well, was, age and on Gaza and a bunch of like nah, you he's, know, challenging he's, topics. He's as thoughtful a uh, uh, late night guys. There is no offense to the other late night guys. But the, the uh, and they're all guys, right? Uh, I mean, that's one of the issues. Uh, but the, the, um, the other funny thing, Tommy, is we've all been there where. You know, if you're a staffer and you mention something to the principal and then you're surprised, like, because what Biden said was, well, my national security advisor, it, it, it sounded like he had just talked to like Jake Dr. Sullivan. Dr. So it's yeah. like, well, my national security advisor just told me that there's a ceasefire. It's yeah. Like, Jake's probably sitting there like, uh, oh, God, please, yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll please get let into, everyone. We'll yeah. get into more detail on all this in one second. Uh, today, we're going to cover the latest from Gaza and how this potential ceasefire news and how the conflict is creating domestic pol political problems for President Biden, even as Netanyahu keeps laying out policy visions that are uh, seem like they're snubbing his nose at the U.S. And we're going to talk about the latest from the International Court of Justice and efforts to deter attacks from Iranian proxy groups in the Middle East, the horrifying casualty count from the war in Ukraine, the latest news about the uh, murder by Russia of opposition leader Alexei Navalny, Russian interference into our elections, CPAC gets real weird. It goes kind of international, Ben. We'll talk about that. Uh, some allegations against the president of Mexico. The Saudis take Miami and then Taylor Swift. Maybe doing battle with Australia at the moment. Have you heard mm, about this? I have not. So I'm looking forward I'm to it. I'm excited to I like you both in. Taylor Swift content and Australian content. So it's our wheelhouse. I'm ready for it. And then, Ben, you just did our interview. What are we going to hear? So we haven't checked in on the situation in Myanmar in a while, um, where it's been pretty astonishing. The opposition forces, this kind of patchwork of different groups fighting against the military junta that. Uh, came to full power in a coup in 2021. Um, the opposition force has been gaining a lot of ground. Yeah. Um, so I talked to YY New, who's a very prominent uh, activist uh, for the Rohingya community, which is the most persecuted of the communities in Myanmar. And we basically did an update on what's going on in the country, um, what is the nature and ambition of the opposition, what is the situation for the Rohingya, who've obviously suffered a lot, and what can the U.S. and other countries do. So it's kind of a a check-in on an issue that we probably should check in on more. Yeah, important update. And also, I know something like near and dear to your heart. I think yes, you yeah. You went there yeah. when? 2021, too? Before that? Yeah, I went pretty much every year starting in, oh, God, uh, like 20... Well, I mean, the last trip. Twenty. Yeah, it started going every year in about 2011. The last time I was there was, um, I'm going to say probably 2018, actually. Oh, okay. Um, so all pre-COVID. Yeah, pre-COVID travel. Um, time has been flattened yeah, out for me. Yeah. Time's a flat circle. So I'd love to go back, um, but you know that's on the cards for a little while. Yeah, just could get rid of a, a junta. Yeah, I got to get rid of the junta. Go then back. I'll go, go back. Work uh, on that one. Yeah, work <laughs> yeah, work yeah. on that turn the break. Yes. Uh, all right, let's start with Gaza because there are some major updates. Um, as you mentioned at the top, as we mentioned at the top, President Biden sounded a hopeful note on prospects for a ceasefire, uh, both during an appearance on Late Night with Seth Meyers and then during this ice cream stop. We'll listen to the interview first. There is a path forward with difficulty, but here's the path forward. Look, first of all, there are the hostages being held must be released. And if we've got a, at least a principle agreement, there will be a ceasefire while that takes place. Ramadan's coming up and there's been an agreement by the Israelis that they would not engage in activities during Ramadan as well in order to give us time to get all the hostages out. That gives us time to begin to move in directions that a lot of Arab countries are prepared to move in. For example, Saudi Arabia is ready to recognize Israel. Jordan, is Egypt, uh, there's six other states. I've been working with Qatar. And so there's a process underway that I think if we get that, that temporary ceasefire, we're going to be able to move in a direction where we can change the dynamic and not have a two-state solution immediately, but a process to get to a two-state solution, a process to guarantee Israel's security and the independence of the Palestinians, but without them being able to, for example, invite in, uh, you know, another country to provide their defenses. And then, as we mentioned during that that ceasefire, or the as we mentioned during that uh, ice cream OTR, 
he put Jake Sullivan on the hook to land this plane <laughs> by yeah. by Monday. So the, the specifics of the ceasefire that have been recorded are complicated. The Times uh, reported that the Israeli War Cabinet approved a six-week truce for the release of 40 hostages. This would also require Israel allowing much, much more aid into Gaza. Um, there are also proposals to release a certain number of Palestinian prisoners being held by Israel for the release of every hostage. Um, there are certain like math equations for different types of people. There's like a certain number of Palestinian prisoners for every female hostage being held. There's another number for the release of civilian men over a certain age. Um, and this is where the, the politics, I think, for Netanyahu get complicated because Hamas is demanding uh, people in prison who are convicted of murder or people who are uh, assessed to have been a part of terrorist attacks. So this is where, you know, you could see Netanyahu's coalition try to like pull the plug on any ceasefire deal and make it harder for him. So that's why I think, you know, we're all kind of nervously watching this. Um, on Monday, Netanyahu said he proposed a plan to his war cabinet to evacuate civilians from Rafa, the city in southern Gaza, where an estimated 1.4 million Gazans are currently sheltering. That would be done in advance of a major military operation uh, that everyone but Netanyahu seems to think would be catastrophic. So, Ben, um, negotiators are meeting this week in Qatar. They're racing to get this ceasefire deal done before Ramadan starts on March 10th. How hopeful are you feeling? I mean, it's interesting that President Biden would kind of preview it. It makes me think he's pretty hopeful. I think so. Um, and, and look, I, I do think that it's not the main point here, but probably don't do this with the ice cream cone, um, given you know uh, it's a good the note. gravity of this circumstances. But I think you made a good summary. It's pretty clear what the administration's plan is, which is try to get a ceasefire, get as many hostages out in the ceasefire as you can, make the ceasefire so long that it becomes harder for Israel to resume its military operation on yeah. the back end of the ceasefire. And then use this time of the ceasefire to get some diplomatic process going with the Saudis and other Arab countries, both around some Gaza plan um, and around uh, the pursuit of a Palestinian state in exchange for normalization with Israel. That's clearly been the, the play that the administration has in mind for some time. Um, I, I was a little struck by the optimism. I mean, if they'd land that plane, you know, that would be a significant progress from where yeah. we are. There's no question about that. Um, from the Israeli side, like you said, I'm sure there are elements of the right wing coalition that Netanyahu has that don't want to release Palestinian prisoners, that don't want to let in a lot of aid, that don't want to, to not go into Rafah. Um, and so there's a Israel piece of this that remains in question. Then on the Hamas side, and you know Hamas has actually kind of poured some cold water on this, and they may be trying to leverage uh, the negotiation to get out as many prisoners as they can. So we'll see if Hamas is truly committed to it. I w wonder about this Arab piece um, because I, I just you know the the two things that I I I'd raise are first of all who's in Gaza? Like, you know, I think that the the preferred option would be that there's some Arab kind of peacekeeping force that is helping to secure Gaza while reconstruction proceeds. Mm -hmm. And yet Israel's not agreed to that at all. Israel's kind of suggested that they want to have this kind of de facto control over yeah. Gaza. And then also, I do wonder, I mean, obviously we've seen with the Abraham Accords, uh, Gulf Arab states in particular be willing to take this step toward normalization. It, it strikes me as a pretty big risk for uh, new Arab states like Saudi Arabia to kind of normalize relations with Israel right in the wake of killing 30,000 Palestinians. I um, so I just, I don't know. I mean, if, if that all comes together, um, that would be quite, you know, remarkable. Um, it does feel like there's a lot of different pieces of this that have to fit in the puzzle board here at a time when the humanitarian circumstances in Gaza is as bad as it's ever been. Yeah, I mean, to that point, I mean, the Egyptians and the Jordanians have been airdropping aid. Yeah. Um, I saw that uh, UNRWA, the UN organization that's able to operate on the ground in Gaza, said the last time they were able to deliver food aid to northern Gaza was January 23rd, so over a month ago. So people in northern Gaza are just starving to death. In, in, in general, the uh, average number of trucks getting into Gaza is something like 50 to 60 trucks, not 200 like the Israelis promised, so it's way under... And UN officials are saying that these aid deliveries have been severely hampered because there were Israeli airstrikes on the police officers who are guarding these convoys, and now they're not operating and supporting these aid deliveries anymore. So the convoys are getting attacked by people who are desperate or criminal elements who are trying to like get the stuff and sell it. So it's an incredibly dire situation. Yeah, it seems like we've reached the tipping point that people have been warning about for some time of just people not having enough food not having enough water, 
there not being any hospital infrastructure left, um, and there being the beginnings of the spread of disease yeah. as people don't have clean water and uh, don't have any sanitation. And, and and frankly, this kind of you know uh, effort to kind of starve UNRWA um, is a part of that picture as well. And so one of the many reasons to try to get a ceasefire is it does feel like absent that in a major change in the dynamic of getting assistance in, there could be this kind of exponential spiral of the humanitarian crisis. Um, and, and that has to be you know, front of mind for everybody, I think, because uh, it, it's obvious to anybody following this that we've reached that point. It's no longer yeah. a warning about some future risk of all these different no, factors. There. It's happening now. We're there. So President Biden is obviously feeling uh, some serious political pressure to get a ceasefire in Gaza. We're taping this on Tuesday, February 27th. Right now, Michigan voters are going to the polls. There's this broad effort to get people to vote uncommitted instead of for Biden in an effort to show, uh, to be a protest vote to the administration's Gaza policy. Organizers say their target is to get 10,000 uncommitted votes. But it's worth noting that uncommitted got about 11% of the vote during the Obama 2012 reelect, which was about 20,000 votes. I wonder what we did. I did. I, you know, I don't I was know. I'm trying I think, to remember why that happened. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know either. Yeah. Maybe people just like, kind of like Mitt Romney. I think yeah. there's just like a, a large uncommitted vote often in, in Michigan. But it, look, I, I don't know. There will be numbers out by the time people are listening yeah. to this. But it was just interesting to see the expectation setting so low. Maybe that's just smart politics, or maybe there's something else going on. Um, uh, also, in terms of you know domestic news. On Sunday, a senior airman in the U.S. Air Force named Aaron Bushnell lit himself on fire in front of the Israeli embassy in Washington to protest the war. Beforehand, he posted a video saying he didn't want to be complicit in genocide, and he shouted, free Palestine, as he burned and later died at the hospital. It's just a horrible scene there. Um, earlier today, Netanyahu released a video pushing back on Biden's obviously true statement uh, from that NBC interview we just heard that Israel is losing international support for the war. Um, Netanyahu claimed that he's been leading an effort aimed at, quote, countering international pressure to end the war ahead of time and mobilize support for Israel. Not sure that has been uh, successful. Yeah, BB. not exactly. Uh, not a deal. Yeah. Uh, also, Netanyahu released a plan for post-war Gaza that included Israel retaining indefinite military control over Gaza while allowing Gazans without links to Hamas to act as civilian administrators. But it seemed like that language is framed to say the Palestinian Authority could not be in charge. And then today, Ben, I saw that the prime minister of the Palestinian Authority resigned, but not President Abbas, which was sort of an interesting shakeup in there. Yeah, th there's a lot of pieces moving around here. I mean, in the domestic politics space, we'll see what happens at the uncommitted vote. I mean, it's also the question of, you know, there have been reports that, you know, it's hard to get surrogates to go to Michigan because <laughs> they're going to get protested, yeah. you know? And so it's not just the vote share. It's also like the enthusiasm. A lot of the people that are sitting it out are the kind of people that might have been organizers for Democrats. But also, like, can you go to college campuses and you, can you go to communities like Dearborn and just show up uh, yeah. it, when people are this angry? Um, so that bears watching as well as the uncommitted uh, count. Uh, I think the Gaza piece that you mentioned, again, the two big outstanding gaps beyond the conduct of the war are this question of, like, who administers Gaza and is there some recognition of a Palestinian state or some at least aspirational recognition of Palestinian state? And again, it just bears repeating on both those questions. Israel's way out of step with the, not just the U.S., but just about everybody else. Um, and and that, that speaks to whether or not this deal can endure. So let, let's say they get the deal. Whether or not that deal leads somewhere kind of depends on those two questions, Gaza administration and Palestinian state. And the thing about the Palestinian Authority, it seems like you know the U.S. and other countries are probably pressing for some reform. And so you get some resignations and you get some right. new technocrats in there or something. But it's got to be more than that, um, it, you know, for the sake of the Palestinians. You know, the, the there has to be this kind of bottom up, you know, investment in uh, meaningful leadership that is close to the community. You know, the problem is not the caliber of the technocrat, although you know you can always try to tinker with that. It's about the legitimacy. Is this kind of old man Mahmoud Abbas sitting in Ramallah yeah. and the people around him? Does he kind of connect down to civil society to young people? It's a very young population. So I'd like to see that effort not just focus on like who are the ministers in the PA, but can you take resources and direct it to people that have real credibility in these communities? Yeah, and the PA is completely broke, and that's going to be an enormous challenge yeah. for reconstruction. Also, I mean, Bibi Netanyahu's plan that he laid out for for post war Gaza says that Israel is going to take control of a sliver of territory in Gaza along the border 
to provide as a buffer zone and prevent another October 7th. That is incredibly controversial. Uh, the plan does not stipulate whether or not Israeli settlers will be allowed to return to Gaza, which... Well, that's a pretty big piece big of Big omission, yeah. 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 The, it calls for the dismantling of UNRWA, the only UN agency operating in Gaza. Yeah. And UNRWA, by the way, um, they said that they have lost $450 million in donor funding since Israel accused 12 UNRWA employees of participating in the October 7th attacks, uh, and they will be out of money by March. So it's just like desperation well, yeah, and for every aid organization. And we've talked about this. So, but, but I, w- what is achieved by that? You know, yeah. there's not some other entity that can perform these services. Um, as we talked about, there's tens of thousands of you know people that are associated with UNRWA because they perform, perform all these various services. I, I just think it's the wrong way of going about it. Um, you know, just starving the only means of reaching uh, Palestinians in Gaza does not feel like the right solution to the problem of 12 pe- those 12 people. You know, it, it, it feels punitive to the, the broader population. Yeah, I mean, the other sort of update from a U.S. perspective is last week, Tony Blinken uh, announced that uh, any expansion of Israeli settlements in the West Bank would be in- inconsistent with international law. That was longstanding yeah, U.S. policy yeah, yeah. until the Trump folks reversed it. I think, I mean, I was glad to see Tony do it. I guess my kind of reaction was, I wonder why it took so long. Yeah, I actually, you know, I actually kind of got frustrated I, to, to be reminded that, that they hadn't done it yet, you know, because that was U.S. policy forever, you know, and uh, it, it speaks to the kind of weird caution that they had on this issue out of the gate because it's not, it shouldn't be controversial that settlements are inconsistent with international law. They are, you know, it, yeah. it, it's not some big new finding by the United States. So, uh, again, I'm glad they did it. Uh, I think what it speaks to is there's another pathway here um, where the U.S., you know, you also saw these sanctions on a few settler uh, leaders. I don't know why that shouldn't, you know, go up to people like Ben Gavir and these people in the government that are Senior literally yeah. saying crazy shit all the time about, you know, moving settlements and di- displacing people in Gaza, kind of wiping out the Palestinians, taking all the land. Like, if that's not U.S. policy... Then again, there should be some consequences for the people that are really driving an extremist agenda, um, and so hopefully this is the beginning of a, uh, of tackling that problem and not kind of the end of a policy process. Yeah, and just you know, when, when Netanyahu returned to power in 2022 with his far right coalition, the number of settlement expansions exploded. It went from like it was like three x yeah uh, in 2023 what it was the year before, just in terms of like all the stages of the bureaucratic process. So. It does seem like they've been acting with impunity for a while. It's interesting, the yeah. administration, though, like there's all this pressure for them to do more in Gaza. They've really been focusing on the settlement piece of it, in this case, belatedly. But, you know, it's just sort of interesting that the like the, the carrot and the stick are not necessarily about the same thing yeah. in terms of policy. Yeah. And it, it, it speaks to, I'm sure, their concern that the settler kind of movement is the driving engine behind this governing coalition. That's right. Yeah. Um, but that is manifest in Gaza more than anywhere else, yeah. too. I mean, the, the situation in the West Bank is concerning as well. But it, it does speak to... We talk about military assistance being conditioned. We talk about calling for and voting for a ceasefire at the UN. Another pathway of trying to affect this you know, extremism on the far right of uh, Israeli politics is going more directly at the, the agenda and, and the leadership of the settler movement in terms of sanctions and... and uh, and calling out uh, the illegality of, of the enterprise. Yeah. I mean, speaking of international legal pressure, um, last month we spoke about the case of the International Court of Justice that had been brought by South Africa accusing Israel of committing genocide in Gaza. This week, hearings wrapped up in a different case that had originally been brought against Israel in 2022, which questioned if Israel is violating international law through the way it has controlled lands in the West Bank, Gaza, and occupied Jerusalem for the last 50 plus years. So the scope is huge because there's like 50 countries participating. Israel has refused to take part in the proceedings. The U.S. position is basically the ICJ should not be attempting to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict through an advisory opinion that is just based on a case made by the uh, Palestinian side. That said, the outcome could come in a few months. It would be non-binding. But uh, we talked with Ona Hathaway again. Uh, she's the founder and director of the Center for, for Global Legal Challenges at Yale Law School. And she talked to us about just the wide ranging potential legal ramifications from this case. Uh, Here's what Ona had to say. If the decision says that some or all of the actions that Israel's undertaken in occupied territories and and in uh, or in Palestine, depending on how you see it, um, are unlawful, 
then that could have an impact on all the organs of the General Assembly. So all the different bodies of the General Assembly then take that um, decision under advisement, and it may affect the ways in which those organs are willing to interact with Israel. And, you know, Philippe Sands, in, in what is one of the more powerful presentations that were uh, given uh, before the court, basically called on all states not to uh, support and um, assist Israel going forward. You know, he said that the right of self-determination requires that member states bring Israel's occupation to an immediate end. And he said, no aid, no assistance, no complicity, no contribution by forcible actions, no money, no arms, no trade, no nothing. That's what he called on member states to do. Um, and I think that that's what uh, Palestine is hoping it will get out of this, is that if there is a decision by the court that the actions by Israel are illegal, then that is going to cause a cascade, I, that's the hope of the advocates of this position, um, to lead states to pull back support and assistance for Israel as long as that occupation and certainly as long as this conflict um, continues. Pretty remarkable. The, yeah. The complexities this could create for U.S. policy, both these cases. Well, you know, the U.S. is kind of an, an actor to it as well, because we are the ones that are providing, you know, the bulk of right. uh, the military assistance to Israel. And diplomatic support. The U.S. government could find itself kind of dragged into these legal proceedings. And look, I think uh, whatever your view of this, um, the reality is, you know, the the kind of talking points loop of the U.S. government, or at least under this administration, wouldn't be under Trump, is about the rules-based order. And and, and the, the, this is the enterprise complicates that, that, yeah. that, that, that is the rules-based order, even, you know, and the, the criticism always of the U.S. is um, we like a rules-based order when we're enforcing the US rules on other countries. Um, again, I think what this could do is lead to a further fracturing of whatever used to be the rules-based order, because yeah. we seem to be moving further and further into reality in which all different big powerful states just are being pretty selective uh, on the menu of the, the rules that they choose to follow and the times that they do. And, and so one outcome could be uh, a further fracturing of the international system that the U.S. frankly built uh, after World War II. And, and, and I think it, whatever happens, I think that is a likely outcome. It just depends on how much that happens. Yeah. Fascinating yeah. to watch. Uh, let's talk about the reaction by Iran and uh, its proxy groups to the war in Gaza. So a few weeks back, an Iranian proxy group fired a drone at a U.S. base in Jordan that killed three U.S. service members. That was one of at least 170 attacks on U.S. troops in the Middle East since mid-October and part of this drastic escalation by Iranian forces since the war started in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and Yemen. Uh, the U.S. responded to that strike in Jordan with airstrikes in Iraq and Syria against these Iranian-linked proxy groups. And uh, there have been just wave after wave of airstrikes in Yemen. The idea was to deter attacks on U.S. personnel or, in the case of the Houthis, attacks on ships in the Red Sea. So the New York Times had a piece this week kind of looking at the results, uh, and they found that since the U.S. response in Iraq and Syria, there have been no attacks on U.S. bases in Iraq and only two minor attacks in Syria, so that's good. Uh, the Times reported that the head of the IRGC went to Baghdad and told these militia groups basically to dial it down because they didn't want a direct war with the U.S., and because Iranian officials believed it would distract from Gaza. I think they thought they were winning yeah. like the PR yeah. war in yeah. Gaza and they didn't want the focus to be on them. Uh, the situation in Lebanon and Yemen is totally different. Hezbollah and Israeli forces are trading shots daily, including there was a Israeli strike 60 miles deep into Lebanon recently. Uh, and then the Houthi rebels in Yemen keep attacking ships in the Red Sea constantly. And the US, the UK, this broader coalition of, uh, of uh, countries keeps blowing up Houthi targets. I think there was one over the weekend. So Ben, I mean, I don't know. It's hard for me to see what, there's not a clear takeaway no, no. from this story, right? But do you have any thoughts about what this says about like deterrence, what works? Um, I, I think that like we shouldn't over or underread this news in the sense that it's pretty obvious that the Iranians were kind of watching this escalation happening and got to a place, even before, by the way, the U.S. strikes, because they could feel those coming. Um, you know, Qatab Hezbollah, the group that was responsible for the strike that killed the U.S. service members, was putting out statements being like, okay, we're done. Yeah, you know, we're, like, yeah, sorry, who, our bad. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and and so it's pretty clear that they want to kind of keep their head down for a little bit here. Um, 
and I do think it's tied to both this thing that uh, this is escalating kind of beyond what we even envisioned, but also this idea that like, why don't we just keep the focus on Gaza? But at the same time, I wouldn't overstate it either because there's been an ebb and flow to these things for years. True. You know, the groups aren't going away. Um, and yeah, the the bigger, more powerful ones, which are Lebanese, Hezbollah, and uh, the Houthis, they're kind of still at it at their own pace. And, um, and and so, yeah, I think for the time being, like things have calmed a bit in this one area of Iraq and Syria, and that that's good. Um, but I don't think anybody should think that that means that, you know, we've permanently restored deterrence and that these groups are kind of changed their colors. Like, Or, by the way, that the U.S. shouldn't be thinking about whether or not, as we said a few weeks ago, it's a good idea to even have some of these troops in these outposts in places like Syria. Um, I, I'd actually be taking advantage of this window to maybe, you know, take a look at that footprint. Do some rethinking. Get some people out of there yeah. um, so that there's not, the next time there's a flare-up, there's not as many vulnerable uh, U.S. service members in the way. Um, but for the time being, uh, you know, it, it, it feels like we're, you know, in a downward trajectory in this one area of Iraq and Syria, but less so in Yemen and, and Lebanon. Yeah, I mean, the, the Times analysis really ascribed a lot of it to, to Qasem Soleimani, the former head of the IRGC, who Trump assassinated, kept a lot of these groups on a very tight leash. Yeah. The new guy apparently gave him a lot more room to run. More of a franchise which, model. Yeah, yeah, yeah which yeah. caused some problems for them. But I, I'm, I'm still with you that I think uh, solving the underlying problem in Gaza is the way to yeah. manage this for good. But there was some more rare good news out of Iran, Ben. So there was a new report from the International Atomic uh, Energy Agency, or IAEA, that shows that Iran has been reducing its stockpile of nuclear weapons grade material. So the Wall Street Journal reported that for the first time since they started producing highly enriched uranium at 60% in 2021, Iran has started to reduce that stockpile by diluting it. Um, if that all sounds like technical jargon, that's okay, it is. Just know that we don't want Iran to have more highly enriched uranium because that's the stuff you use to make a bomb and the more enriched it is, the more quickly you can do it. The new this news doesn't mean that their overall program is isn't expanding. It is, but it does seem like a sign of de-escalation to the U.S. and other Western countries who watch these things closely. Um, ben, reading these reports, it made my like NSC nerd spidey senses tingle a little bit and wonder if this was some sort of like confidence building effort as part of I don't know yeah. secret talks we don't know about through Oman or something. I don't know. Is that too hopeful? Too no, nerdy? No, I I think that. Look, the Iranians, like you said, they, they've ramped up their program. Congratulations, uh, Iran deal opponents. Um, like Pompeo. They want to have the kind of capability, if they so choose, to, to potentially break glass and maybe get enough material for weapon. They'd have to figure out how to weaponize it, you know. Um, but what I wonder, the, the two things, you know, one is, are there back channel discussions? And is this some kind of signal of, you know, we're not looking for the nuclear crisis now, and maybe there's some diplomatic pathway somewhere with the U.S. towards some version of an Iran nuclear agreement that's probably not as ambitious as the last one. Or, you know, they're the key partners for the Iranians are the Russians and the Chinese. Um, are they talking to the Russians and Chinese and saying, okay, let's not like introduce the nuclear piece to this now, like just, you know, dial it back a little bit, you know, keep the, again, keep the focus on Gaza. That's embarrassing the Americans. That's, you know, uh, obviously undermining Israel standing in the world you know, that, you know, there's got to be some reason for it. Yeah. Um, and I have to think that it's some version of all three, right? Like not looking for the, the war of the nuclear program at this point, um, maybe some consultation with their kind of key partners and yeah, maybe, maybe, um, some kind of back channel conversations that are just meant to signal a willingness to talk about this. Maybe they could do, uh, get the negotiators some ice cream and like Muscat or, <laughs> you know, I don't know where, where else, Switzerland somewhere. I, yeah. Zurich. Uh, that feels like a good. Geneva, Geneva Vienna. Where... You know, the last time it was Oman, Geneva, Vienna. Yeah. I uh, went to the Iran deal talks in Geneva and it was this beautiful chalet on the lake and just a ton of people smoking cigs. Yeah. It didn't lot, seem like a lot got done. A lot of smoking at these uh, diplomatic <laughs> just things. Just ripping so, yeah. butts. Uh, that, that was not good for my health in the yeah. White House. Everywhere years. I looked, I assumed like that plant would be like a CIA yeah. listening <laughs> yeah, tree. Yeah. Probably. Oh, well, yeah. You know, you'd be in one of those lobbies and you'd look around the lobby at these things and think that like what percentage of the people in this lobby are, are in some intelligence. 110%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 like yeah, a dude yeah. with like a flower lapel yeah, pointing yeah, it at yeah, you. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> okay. A lot of listening. Uh, just don't think that your AirPods aren't connected to nine phones in that lobby. Oh, you know? oh, absolutely. So we talked a lot last week about the war in Ukraine in the run-up to the two-year anniversary. So we'll get a little shorter on that topic today. But a couple things we wanted to flag. 
Uh, First, Hungary officially approved Sweden's entry into NATO. That comes after the Swedish prime minister visited Hungary and announced that Sweden's going to provide Hungary with four Swedish-made jets. So that's how deals get done, I guess, Ben. (laughs) Uh, But this, along with uh, Finland's entry into NATO last spring, means that the NATO presence in the North Sea around the Baltics will be a hell of a lot stronger, which Putin will hate. Uh, Though I did read that uh, Finland dismantled 90% of its army and 70% of its navy and air force after the Soviet Union collapsed. That is a hell of a peace dividend for those mm-hmm, guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also looks like prime, Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte will be the next Secretary General. So anything You're kind of classic Northern Re- European. Uh, well, he's been around forever, so yeah. he's an obvious choice. Um, you know, the funny thing about the Orban piece is, you know, Orban thinks it makes him look like super strong to like hold up Sweden for a while. But in the end, it kind of looks weak. Yeah, right? four planes. Yeah, yeah, because it's like, <laughs> oh, you know, look at me. I showed that I can like be the spoiler and hold these people out and make the Swedish prime minister come visit me. But at the end of the day, he caves. Uh, so yeah. I actually don't know that like he looks like such a tough guy. You know, I don't the either. Yeah, he kind of got strong armed. Yeah. So, um, congratulations yeah. on your four planes. Yeah, way to be a victor. Have fun at CPAC. I was. I will say, I was in Sweden, and you know, great country. Uh, I, I, but you're like you're aware that under the surface, and it goes back you know, hundreds of years, that there's like a, a Viking thing happening you know, under the surface. That if, if shit hit the fan, You're talking DNA or volcanoes? I'm talking about DNA. I'm talking okay. about if like the shit hit the fan, I wouldn't want to you know, swords. I wouldn't fuck out. around with that. Like no. the beards are going to grow and the swords could yeah, come yeah, out. Yeah, you know? yeah, they're they're, yeah. they're going to take you out. Yeah, they're they're some serious dudes. Yeah, I mean, just watch Thor. I mean, and the Norwegians are involved in this. The Danes. I mean, it's not just the there's, Swedes, but I'm just saying. That they, these people, you know, they're they're reasonable and peaceful people, but uh, you know, th- there's a little Aragon in there. There's know. some foreign like uh, Viking comedy on Netflix at the moment that I tried to get into. I it I didn't take, but I'm gonna go back. I'd be curious to the pitch meeting on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, that's what I made over there. Yeah. Um, okay, the other thing about it, I wanted to flag is just there's been a lot of news on just the astronomical casualty count from this war. Yeah. So President Zelensky announced that 31,000 Ukrainian soldiers have died in the last two years. A lot of analysts think the real number is even higher than that. On the Russian side, a Russian military blogger recently said that Russia lost 16,000 troops just during the battle uh, for Avdivka, along with 300 armored vehicles. So 16,000 deaths in a battle for a place that everyone involved says has like symbolic value, but limited strategic value. So, uh, of course, like Russia's bigger, that is a bigger population. It's like three times the size of Ukraine. And Putin conscripted around 300,000 guys in 2022. So I guess on paper, he can afford to lose all these people, but it's still shocking. And then on the Ukrainian side, they're debating whether to pass a new modified conscription bill. Apparently, the military asked for 450,000 to 500,000 new troops. Zelensky's not sure it's workable. Uh, According to Michael Kaufman, who's a military analyst who focuses on Russia and Ukraine, The average age of Ukrainian soldier is over 40 years old. Can you imagine like being on the front lines for weeks and weeks and weeks at our age? And they desperately need more troops. Um, Zelensky is worried about calling up these young guys because of what it would do to the economy, what losing that generation would mean for Ukraine's future as a state, and the uncertainty of whether the U.S. is going to be around to actually train and assist these guys. So I just wanted to flag that, Ben, because like obviously the human death toll is so awful but also to make the point that one, I mean, again, like even Ukraine's ability to call up more troops is dependent on this U.S. fight in Congress. And two, when you hear about the status quo as is, it's just it's not a recipe for a stalemate in the long run. It, it's it's a setup where Ukraine is going to lose the war absent more support and like some serious internal changes as well. Yeah, and I mean, on the Ukrainian side, they've had this kind of theory of you know fighting for every inch of territory and and bleeding the russians but the reality is i don't know that they can continue to fight the war that way they just don't have as many people even if the casualty count is higher on the russian side that's not how wars are won or lost and and so i think they're gonna have to be more selective about how and where they go on the offense and and the nature of the defense that they use because uh, you know, there's just more Russians and, and there's a willingness from Putin, I think, to do whatever he needs to do from a conscription basis. And given his kind of total dictatorial control, he doesn't have to worry about fractures in the society no. in the same way. Now, on the Russian side, I, I don't think he has to worry in the near term about like sustaining the war effort. It's in the medium and longer term, as we talked about last week, 
what is going to happen to the communities that are losing all these people? It's, you know, it's and unbelievable. And, and that I think is a real threat to Russia internally in the not too distant future. And and I don't know that that I don't mean that that's some strategy for Ukraine to win the war, but it's no. something to watch. Like I just don't know what Russia is going to look like in five years if they've lost hundreds of thousands of people. That's widows. That's people that aren't you know uh, th- that are lost to the economy. That's you know veterans returning home with wounds and 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 issues. You know, um, I, I, I the bill will come due uh, for this incredible loss on the Russian side. Um, the question is just how and when. Yeah, I mean, so in Ukraine, men between the ages of eighteen and twenty six can't be drafted, but they're encouraged to volunteer. Men between twenty seven and sixty years old can be drafted and forced to mobilize. They're kind of debating whether to adjust the ages on their conscription laws. But part of the challenge is exactly what you were just describing, which is that Ukraine just has a much lower percentage of its population in that younger generation. And they're yeah. worried about just hollowing out the future of the country. Like yeah. Killing off the people who would live there and like keep the state going. Yeah. And and will people return? And they also have the question of well, how long do people stay in? Because I mean, some of these people have been like right. two years they're on the front rotating, line, like you yeah. said. And like, there's got to be some ability for them to rotate out. I mean, people will have to see their families. People have to, they need a break, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, last week, we also talked a lot about Alexei Navalny, the Russian opposition leader and anti-corruption activist who was murdered in a Russian penal colony on February 16th. Uh, some updates there. So according to Navalny's team, his body has now finally been returned to his mother. She had been in this awful public battle with prison officials. She was trying to locate the body, then get them to release it to her. It was awful. Um, prison officials were putting conditions on the release. They were telling his mother that she had to agree to a secret funeral or else he would be buried at this penal colony. Now Navalny's team is saying they're unable to find a venue in Russia that will hold his funeral for him. They're like releasing videos, trying to ask anyone for help. Uh, and they want to hold a public service at the end of this week. Um, Navalny's team has also said that negotiations for his release as part of a prisoner exchange were in the final stages before his death. That was supposedly a deal that would have included uh, Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich and security executive Paul Whalen, who's been detained for several years. Um, they were all in exchange for a man named Vadim Kraskikov, uh, a Russian convicted of killing a former Chechen separatist fighter in Germany. So it sounds like the U.S. and the Germans might have been talking about the outlines of this deal, obviously, since the Germans are holding the guy that the Russians want. But the U.S., according to NBC News, the U.S. hadn't yet approached the Russians about this deal yet. I don't know what to make of this report. Um, I'm skeptical that Putin yeah. would release Navalny. Yeah. And I'm also skeptical that he would kill Navalny to scuttle a deal that he would have had to approve anyway. But I don't know. What do you make of all this? I, I don't. I just don't think that that was going to happen. I mean, I don't think Putin would. Uh, Putin swaps people that he says are spies. Evan Gershkowitz is not, but they categorize right. him that way. The, the releasing a, a Russian opposition leader for one guy, it, it's clear the Russians want that guy. He came up in the Brittany Griner context. Yeah, but I, I, I just think that that that's highly unlikely. I will say, like when you watch this stuff about the body, and you watch this absurdity of them saying that Navalny died of natural causes, and them not wanting to have a public funeral, um, again, like for a guy who's supposed to be in such control here, what is he so scared of? You know, I mean, it does. It, 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 there's a paranoia. So there's a pettiness, but also a paranoia, like that that they clearly feel like they have to keep the lid on so tight. It might be because they sense that if you allow the lid to peek up an inch, like it could explode. And 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 so I think in death, Navalny is once again illustrating the kind of weakness of Putin in a lot of ways. Uh, I don't want to overstate that. You know, Putin's in control, but it is the case that like if you can't even allow for there to be a funeral for somebody um, because you're so afraid of what that would be like. Um, maybe you're not as firmly in control as you're projecting to the rest of the world into Tucker Carlson in the Moscow metro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it does seem so petty and so small. And right, and we talked last week about how they were, you know, security officials were beating up people, just like yeah. putting down flowers at memorials and things. You know, yeah. it's just brutality. Um, speaking of Russia, Ben, so it's uh, election season's coming up. You got artificial intelligence making it easier than ever to make fake images and audio and videos. And then NBC- You uh, make good ones. Huh? Thank I've, you. I've heard them, yeah. I did not make the Biden robocall, but I wish I had. <laughs> <laughs> Mine would have been funnier. Yeah. Um, NBC News had a story on Monday. The headline was, Russia's 2024 election interference has already begun. That is mostly about Russia using these fake online accounts and bot networks to spread disinformation or just real negative stories. 
about Biden or Democrats or anyone who wants to support Ukraine or NATO. Uh, the Russians are doing similar things in Europe ahead of the European parliamentary elections in June. But Ben, it gets even weirder in the U.S., where we recently learned that the key Republican witness in their farce of an impeachment effort against President Biden has ties to Russian intelligence. Uh, here's a clip from Congressman Jamie Raskin. Now we know that Russian intelligence operatives were behind creating the propaganda and disinformation at the very foundation of this investigation. So I think it's time for uh, Chairman Comer and the Republicans to fold up the circus tent and we should get back to work for the American people. Certainly it was a, a shattering revelation yesterday when we learned that Smirnoff was collecting his information from Russian intelligence operatives that were at the very base of this whole investigation. Uh, yesterday's revelations demonstrate that Putin's pattern of interference and destabilization of uh, foreign democratic elections around the world, including in America, has continued to this very day. Um, and this impeachment investigation is nothing but a wild goose chase that is based on Russian disinformation and propaganda. Just a little background. So this is a guy named Alexander Smirnov. He was a trusted FBI informant who'd been paid by the U.S. government for information about like oligarchs, officials, whatever. Uh, in June of 2020, so in the middle of the last presidential election, Smirnov told the FBI that the owner of Burisma, the big Ukrainian energy company that's been swirling around all the stories about Hunter Biden, had paid Joe Biden and Hunter Biden $5 million each to stop an investigation into Burisma or to have Joe Biden do it when he was vice president. Uh, the FBI has now indicted Smirnov for lying because those allegations were made up. It was very easy to call him on this lie. Smirnov said he met with Burisma officials in 2015 and 2016, but the FBI knew he met them for the first time in 2017. There were <laughs> lies about where he traveled. And prosecutors also said that the information Smirnov shared about the Bidens came from officials associated with Russian intelligence. So Smirnov's allegations, like they quickly leaked to the right-wing press and to Republicans. Uh, so the House Republicans doing the impeachment, they demanded these like FBI documents about, you know, what he had told them. They then went public with them. Now they look like fucking morons because this guy was clearly a, a Russian intel op. Ben, even describing all of that to you <laughs> is exhausting and makes me uh, have 2017 PTSD. But it's obviously also like a huge deal that these guys are yeah. already trying to yeah. mess with our elections or I guess. And got all the way into an impeachment. The 2020 yeah. election. Yeah, yeah. yeah. got to yeah. an impeachment. Yeah. yeah. How do you combat this stuff when you have a Republican Party that would clearly rather destroy Joe Biden, Joe Biden than guard against it? Well, I think, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, right answer. there's these different categories, right? Because first of all, in the in information space, it's just a cesspool. And, and what people have to recognize is that the Russians don't create the origin of a lot of these conspiracy theories. They see what's happening in our weird right-wing fever dream ecosystem and they come in and basically just pour gasoline on it and try to turbocharge conspiracy theories and anti-biden content and they'll be doing that and they'll be doing a lot of that and ai like you said makes it easier for them to do that i mean there's some efforts that uh, are underway to at least try to label the ai the water market, you know water yeah. market so in this came up and i was in munich in part uh you know to be in some of these conversations um because you know at a minimum you know people should know i, I mean the the sad thing for me is that Twitter actually last time was labeling state sponsored content. You know, mm -hmm. now it's like a cesspool it's, of Elon it's Musk. The worst. But but so one thing on the on the information space is you'd like to at least be able to empower people with the information about where this is coming from. I do worry this time about whether the Russians, given the stakes are very high for them, what do they do around the election itself? You know, is there much more dis and misinformation about you know voting or their efforts to kind of interfere with the voting process itself. So you have to kind of watch that space. And then on this stuff, I mean, I don't know, Tommy, like the, the thing that is really frustrating and, and probably obvious is that there's such an over-the-top effort by Trump and his allies to kind of make all the Russia stuff feel like it was over-torqued yep. and it was a hoax and that people, you know, and I've I'll, even internalized it. I've been, well, and look again, I, I hate to like call out trolling, but like, you know, Glenn Greenwald's been like after me for years because I said something about the, uh, the laptop being part of a Russian disinformation campaign, which, you know, some of it was you know, like, like uh, this guy was a part of, you know, there, there are these, there's this policing of the, the center left and left on this stuff that if you like, if you get like anything is over cranked at all. You're cast as like a lunatic 
And yet, actually, the underlying truth is still there. Like, there are yeah. Russian agents spreading disinformation to the point that they're literally the basis of impeachment of the president of the United States. Yeah. And so... Pretty goddamn effective. I just think that we need to not be that, you know, self-constrained. Sure, we need to be careful and not make statements that we don't know, have information about um, or don't have credible information about. But, like, don't let them work the ref so hard that we're not at least calling out, like, hey, this is what's happening, you know? Yeah, it's a good point. I do think that and this is more of a just an online phenomenon. Yeah. But like we probably shouldn't have called Mitch McConnell Moscow Mitch. No, and, and, and we didn't need like you know Bob Mueller and like a <laughs> superhero's uniform next to like uh <laughs> what's his name? Michael Aven- uh, Avenatti. Avenatti, yeah, like, yeah. Like, Wow, like, good callback. Like, the, the kind of stupidity of some of that stuff like undermined the fact that it did. there really was some it real did not just smoke there's a lot of fire there too and it'll be here this election too and not everyone who disagrees with biden's ukraine policy is a russian Russian stooge right like there's good faith disagreements but also two weeks before Slovakia's parliamentary elections in in september there was a fake audio clip showing like you know that purported to show a pro-western party was trying to rig the election it was all made up and bullshit but like that's going to happen and guess what like the pro-russian uh autocrat won the slovakian election i mean so this stuff is real and has a real impact and the, the only anybody's we can think of is just trying to empower people with as much information as you can, knowing that even that is going to be out in this crazy space where there's no objective reality. Yeah. Uh, speaking of uh, far right weirdos abroad, let's talk about CPAC, the Conservative Political Action Conference. It just ended. It was, you know, your standard right wing buffet of uh, bigotry bullshit and like Trump worship. Um, Trump spoke for an hour and a half. A bunch of literal Nazis attended. They mingled with guests. They were like <laughs> goose stepping around and like yeah. doing the salute thing. Uh, once again, there were a smattering of right wing leaders. There was uh, Liz Truss, the idiot who was British prime minister for like six minutes. There was Javier Mille, the right wing anarcho capitalist president of Argentina. <laughs> there was the Bitcoin community's favorite dictator, Nayib Bukele from El Salvador. Uh, we wanted to play you a clip, a couple of clips from Bukele's speech. To just get at how weird it was to have these guys come to the U.S., talk about kind of being autocrats publicly, all but endorse Trump in the kind of MAGA Bannon worldview. Uh, here's a couple clips. Let's go with the first is about global elites, Ben. The global elites, they hate our success and they fear yours. The people's free will to choose their leaders is something they despise because they cannot control that. You have experienced this firsthand here in the United States. The global elites control the mainstream media. They finance campaigns. District attorneys, to mention a few. They abuse their powers. They persecute political opponents. In El Salvador, we don't weaponize our judicial system to persecute our political opponents. A practice that may sound familiar to you, but we don't do that there. And who's the dictator? That's a little joke. Who's the dictator? Yeah. I mean, how weird is it here? Like an us versus them with a, a president of a foreign country versus yeah. like democracy or Democrats? I guess, you know, first of all, what it does kind of demonstrate, though, is that there and this is another we, you know, poking a little uh, at the resistance that, you know, we were part of. Um I think there was this effort to kind of cast Trump as this buffoon, you know, who kind of uh, was dangerous, but, you know, a bit of an outlier to anything we'd seen in America. No, th- this is like, there's a real ideology behind it that like Bukele yeah. and Mile, these guys, like the fact that it travels around to such different places, you know, Trump is as much a reflection of something happening in the world as he is somebody driving it. I mean, there's just this kind of, anti-globalist, anti-elites, uh, autocratic populism that that travels and that has like a potency to it that that needs to be taken seriously, even if it's totally hypocritical, right? I mean, Bukele, like Trump, is projecting. He does all those things. He persecutes right. opponents. He's got people in prison. So I'm not suggesting it's true. I'm he marched just, troops into parliament. Yeah, the vote. yeah. I mean, <laughs> this guy is like, yeah. So like, it, it, but it like, let's, you know, this is going to be around for a while. And, and actually, that's my second point, which is that, we we don't do this. Why don't we do this? Why why don't I'm not saying we have a CPAC that's as crazy, but like there's this reticence to kind of, you know, align with political parties and movements Amen. around the world. Like 
the, the I'd like there to be some gathering of, I mean, I've been to some of them, but they're like much more muted <laughs> than this. I mean, I, I well, the my, U.S. president probably doesn't speak at them, right? Like yeah. Trump stamping like his reputation imprimatur on this thing, getting a lot of eyeballs there. Like that makes a difference. Yeah. My point Elevates is that the, the Democratic Party in this country needs to feel more invested in the success of yeah. center left and left uh, politicians around the world and need not be shy about it uh, because look, these guys are very coordinated. Um, they're sharing messaging. They're sharing media strategies. They're sharing resources. And, and we're just not doing that at the scale that we should be. Um, and, and so weirdly, we could learn something from from CPAC. Yeah. And like we have one more clip. I'll just summarize it because we're going a little long. But like like uh, Bukele has like a minute long extended riff about George Soros. And it's just fascinating that yeah. these guys have all found a common enemy to like bring this group of right wing yeah. zealots. A together. man in his 90s. You know, you know it's yeah. like and you, when you when I was listening to BBC World uh, podcast, they were running around CPAC talking to people like. These folks now all oppose Ukraine funding. They're all like big yeah. Bolsonaro fans, right? Yeah. There's like a herd mentality on foreign policy where they're all getting behind the same things. Yeah, and 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 it's what they're doing that's interesting and, and smart um, is people are sick of globalization for some good reasons. Right? The inequality yeah. that's been created, the sense that the system is broken and doesn't work anymore. Now, what they're doing is they're somehow tying all this to like George Soros, who's done like the... He's not, I mean, it's basically an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. Yep. I and mean, that's the other thing I'd say is that like all the people that are so concerned about like campus anti-Semitism, like why don't you look over here where the actual Nazis are showing Literal up. Literal Nazis. And they're, even the the the, uh, the leaders are like- Calling themselves engaging, nationalist you know, socialists. You know, saying there's like a shadowy <laughs> financier Jewish man yeah. pulling the strings. But like, so you have to separate out the crazy and the bigotry from what is them connecting to- because the the problem for center left parties right now is we're like the defenders of the establishment, you know, like right. how dare you impugn the integrity of the intelligence community, and <laughs> you know, and it's like that's a little like no offense to the intelligence community, but that's not no. like the politically smart place to be these days. Not a winning message. Yeah. We're also like usually hodgepodges and coalitions that are multi ethnic yeah. yeah. and different views, et cetera. Uh, a couple more quick things, Ben. So uh, the New York Times reported that American law enforcement officials spent years investigating allegations that uh, President Lopez Obrador, AMLO, the president of Mexico had met with and taken millions of dollars from drug cartels after he took office. Uh, apparently, these investigators found links between the cartels and officials close to AMLO, but no connection to AMLO himself. So there was never a, a formal investigation. Um, ProPublica also recently reported that in 2006, the DEA heard allegations that drug traffickers had donated to AMLO's campaign at the time. Uh, so this all became public, uh, and AMLO did a press conference to respond, and he took it about as well as you'd expect. He denied all the charges, and he even read the New York Times Mexico Bureau Chief's phone number aloud on TV during the press conference. Obviously, that's like, you want to laugh at that because it's so like petulant and yeah. dickish. It's like, remember when Trump did that to Lindsey Graham? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that was, was actually, that was actually kind of yeah, great. Yeah. But in Mexico, you got a lot of <laughs> reporters are getting murdered. Uh, it's actually illegal to dox someone like that in Mexico, so they're now investigating AMLO for doing this stupid shit. Anyway, not great all around, the allegations, no. the response, all of it. Um, ben, we should note that the former president of Honduras is currently on trial in New York for drug trafficking, so it's not unprecedented to prosecute a former head of state. What Could you imagine what would have happened if they tried to bring charges against a sitting head of state like this? How the fuck would that work? Yeah, and a very popular one of a big, important country... That is absolutely essential to any effort to deal with our border or deal with the cartels. Right. So I, it was it was interesting that this kind of leaked out. I'm kind of curious, like, were people that were investigating it disgruntled and they put it out? Um, the fact that the U.S. kind of furiously backtracked, I mean, it shows you how much they need net Mexico. We can't solve any of these problems with Me without Mexico. And, uh, and so AMLO has a lot of leverage in this case. Yeah, he really does. He'd be like, come and get me. Yeah. Let's see it. Uh, speaking of corrupt presidents, uh, former French president Nicolas Sarkozy was found guilty of illegally overspending during his 2012 presidential campaign. How many crimes does that guy, you know, like, <laughs> so, like a buffet? A buffet yeah, well, crimes. it is a buffet. He's going to appeal this one. He yeah. might get like six months in his house with an ankle monitor, but whatever. Is he still married to Carla Bruni? I wondered that yeah, too. Yeah. I don't know. We should look that we up. We should check yeah. that. Uh, but to your point, in 2023, he was found guilty of trying to bribe a judge. And next year, <laughs> he's going to get tried for illegally taking money from now deceased uh, Libyan dictator Muammar Gaddafi. Yeah. So that's a pretty big one. Yeah. Uh, especially given how much, uh, you know, Sarkozy wanted to take him out. Not at the exactly time. a master criminal here. You know? No. Yeah. No, not very good at job. Uh, ben, uh, 
Remember back in 2018, the Saudis executed the Washington Post opinion writer, Jamal Khashoggi? Yes. And there was, felt like there was a sea change. Yeah. Business leaders wouldn't do business with the Saudis. Some CEOs refused to go there or attend their Davos in the Desert Investment Conference. Hmm. I have some bad news for you. Uh, a couple of years and a few trillion dollars can make a hell of a lot of difference. So now we have Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's personal think tank, the Future Investment Initiative Institute. What a name. Uh, it's holding conferences here in the United States, including last week in Miami. The topics were notionally big ideas like AI or climate change, but really it was just a bunch of star fuckers who wanted Saudi money. We had Gwyneth Paltrow was there, Rob Lowe, the CEOs of Blackstone yeah. and Palantir, some former Trump, I'm going to try to trigger you now, Trump, former Trump officials like Jared Kushner, uh, Mike Pompeo, Steve Mnuchin. According to a, a great report by a friend of the pod, Jonathan Geyer in the American Prospect, Larry Summers and Eric Schmidt uh, did a panel where they reminisced about how much they missed Henry Kissinger. Is this working? God, it's all my favorites. <laughs> uh, the hits just keep on coming, Tommy. Some American journalists hosted panels, hopefully not about bone saws. Uh, Gwyneth was unironically talking about fighting the patriarchy during this Saudi hosted event. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so Ben, I get the only silver lining here, I guess, is according to Jonathan, there were like only 50 people watching this live stream, this event that cost like millions. But I don't know, man, like what, what's the lesson? Money always wins? Yeah. It's so depressing. It's really depressing. I mean, it, and, and you know, what, what I'd say is like, how much is enough? I mean, we've said this before, but like, Gwyneth, you're doing fine with the goop. So like, much is, money. Is it really worth the appearance fee? Like, you just sell your goop and be cool with it. Um, Rob Lowe, like West Wing, like, you know, filled everybody with an earnest uh, idealism. <laughs> what would Sam Seaborn have said about this appearance at the Davos on South Beach or whatever it yeah, was? You know, like, not good. Um, it, it just, there's, there's other ways to make a living without that appearance fee. Um, and yeah, like the Larry Summers chuckling, like, uh, about the good old days with, Henry Kissinger, when you could take money from dictators and not get called out about it. I mean, just it's just there's just a got to be a better. Way. And it, by the way, connects to the CPAC thing because that's the kind of stuff that people are mad about. Now, obviously, like it skews right. I mean, Jared's there and mm -hmm. Trump is buddies with these people, but like th that kind of stuff is what people are like looking at as the this elite that just is totally out of touch with and hypocritical. With, yeah, there's just, you know it just makes everybody look like hypocrites. It's so maddening. Yeah. It's so maddening. And they're doing it in the U.S. The, it, it, under the guise of these, these think tanks and, you know, the Saudi Sovereign Wealth Fund is buying teams, you know, and they're pretending that it's not Mohammed bin Salman pulling <laughs> yeah, the trickles. Yeah, like, yeah, ah, of yeah. course he is. Yeah. Of course yeah. he's behind all of this. It's just yep. the worst. He wins, we lose. Uh, finally. Yeah, that's a the life lesson yeah, there. that's a life lesson. Finally, Ben, uh, listeners to the show know that we're big fans of Australia uh, and we're very grateful to the Aussies in particular for filling the back half of this show, this portion of the yeah, show, yeah. with lots of fun stories. Uh, but today we owe you an apology. So an Australian photographer has accused Taylor Swift's father of punching him in the face as Taylor and her crew oh, got I off a yacht. This. Yeah. They were at a Jeez. wharf uh, in the Sydney area. It was after Taylor's final concert tour. Where the hell was Travis Kelsey is what I want to know, playing a little yeah, defense yeah. here. So Taylor's dad is 71. He punched a 51-year-old photog. The, Aust <laughs> the Australian media has this amazing video of Taylor walking with her dad, hiding under an umbrella, and then her dad like gives the photographer the bird in the process. So I don't know what to make of this. My favorite part of the story <laughs> is that Taylor's spokesperson is quoted everywhere, and her name is Tree Pain, which makes me wonder if uh, you know she's like being Tree Pain, like Tree Pain, like she's trying to stop the trees' pain. Or? I don't know yeah. that, or she was unfairly maligned for using auto tune, but is actually very talented. Mm. Yeah, could be That's either true. way. Yeah. Here's what I want to know. Are we going to have to take Hugh Jackman hostage like Putin style so that we can swap him for Taylor Swift or her <laughs> yeah. father? I, or is there like a legal proceeding though? I mean, like I, uh, I can't imagine it's legal to just wind up and clock a photographer. Well, it's right? Australia. Um, yeah, actually that's true. Maybe they, this, that's like, all part of the, the, <laughs> the maybe, charm. Uh, like, I, maybe that's the way to look at this whole incident. It's like, this is going to go over there. You get, you get in a fist fight uh, after the yacht comes in and everybody like talks about it for a while and then, you know, moves on. I mean, yeah. Uh, I don't know what to make of it. It feels a little aggressive uh, for, for the, the Taylor Swift dad. Uh, yeah, like, I mean, sh where's Jason Kelsey with his shirt off? You know, I don't like, know. Uh, just kind of taking they, up a lot of space so you can't get a picture. They could have yeah. beaten up everybody. I don't know. We'll see what happens. I do. I have been listening to um, uh, Colin Hay from Men at Work's solo stuff a lot recently. 
Mm. Truly great. This guy is, I didn't know that there was solo stuff. I, I he's I well, some of them are like meta work songs that he just does like acoustic in places. I would listen to that. Um, excellent. Yeah, that is excellent. Excellent, yeah. excellent. Thank you, TikTok, for injecting. Maybe that what my brain. the solution is is that Taylor lets him be the opening act at the Taylor next and Colin Hay. Yeah, who's Colin the headliner? Hay, uh, well, you know, it depends on what demographic. You depends are. on where you yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. If you're in Sydney, maybe it's Colin. If yeah. That's well, no, probably Taylor anyway. It's probably Taylor anyway. Okay. Well, good luck with that, Australia. Uh, we hope you sort it out. We're gonna take a quick break, and we come back. You will hear. Ben's interview about all the things that are happening in Myanmar. So stick around for that. So it's now been three years since uh, a military coup in Myanmar ousted the uh, elected government of Aung San Suu Kyi. Um, That followed, uh, of course, uh, like a brutal period of ethnic cleansing of uh, the Rohingya, uh, during which Aung San Suu Kyi was uh, silent. Um, And since the coup... Uh, we've seen a bloody civil war that the UN estimates has led to the displacement of two, 2.6 million uh, further people. Um, but interestingly, in recent months, things have been shifting against the military junta inside of the country. So joining me to talk about the latest developments and, and where this is all leading um, is a, a terrific uh, activist and advocate, uh, YY Nu, uh, who is a human rights activist from Myanmar and the director and founder of the Women's Peace Network. Uh, it's so good to see you again after a few years, YY. So good to see you too. Thank you for having me. So I want to start with the situation just generally in Myanmar, um, and then we'll also uh, talk about uh, the situation for the Rohingya people. Mm -hmm. Beginning in Myanmar, um, so it's been three years since the coup. Since then, I think uh, to a lot of analysts, uh, you know, opposition forces seem to have shown uh, a surprising strength in the the civil war. Uh, In recent weeks, there have been reports of thousands of young people trying to find a way out of the country to avoid a new conscription law that the military is trying to use to, to regenerate manpower. Um, that conscription move follows gains made by various rebel groups across the country who've been uniting and taking territory. Um, the exiled government, the National Unity Government, that's the opposition force, the kind of umbrella over the opposition, uh, now says that uh, some 60% of Myanmar's territory is under uh, the control of resistance forces. Um, so just starting there, YY, based on your contacts and what you're following, um, what is your sense of the situation? It, is, it, is it the case that the junta is kind of losing control? Um, how do you assess what's happening in the country? Um, indeed, um, we have to acknowledge that junta, the junta was never able to control the country and consolidate its powers since the attempted coup in February 2021. Um, due to their popular resistance to it. Now adding to this uh, collective military operations by the ethnic arms group, it's become even harder um, to retain control of the territory, which uh, we see they are losing by the day. And it also shows how the Myanmar military or junta is weaker than many thought. At the same time, we have also seen the junta uses every possible means to maintain the power, including commissions of serious international crimes, such as crimes against humanity, war crimes, through uh, their discriminate uses of forces, uh, shellings against the civilians and villages, widespread and systematic uh, uh, arrest, uh, detentions, killing, rapes, and so on. And um, now uh, the latest Um, information we are uh, documenting is that the junta actually arresting uh, young people on the street in the villages across the country. And that is why um, many of them are lining up in front of the embassies and even to the point that uh, result in unfortunate death of young people. So there are a lot of optimistic view around what is going on and people are still hopeful and committed to defeat the military. Uh, However, we are also extremely concerned about the situations on the ground, the impact on the women, young people, and the people of Burma. So there is a mixture of feeling among the the people. Although people are committed and united uh, to defeat them, but we also have to acknowledge this, um, the catastrophic situations and and, uh, find ways to uh, and these um, the, to end or to 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 resolve the crisis in Burma as soon as possible. So I'm curious about your view of 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 the opposition 
uh, forces. You know, for people who don't follow this that closely over the years, it was always the case in, in Myanmar, uh, Burma or Myanmar, that we can use that interchangeably, um, that you had these ethnic armed groups uh, who were in conflict with uh, the military. Um, and what I've noticed since the coup in 2021 is a greater degree of unity among different ethnic groups that are fighting and also among some Burmese um, who have joined forces with uh, ethnic armed groups um, to oppose the junta. So you have kind of a bigger tent, if you will, over these opposition forces who've put aside differences in some cases to fight together against the junta or to fight at least from a shared cause. Um, what is your assessment? Uh, you know, how much is there a new sense of unity in forces opposing the junta? How much does the, the national unity government kind of reflect uh, those opposition forces? Um, and, and do you think that that can be sustained going forward? It is incredible that the, we achieve this level of unity and common understanding among the different um, ethnic groups and different political groups. Um, after this attempted coup in 2021, people across the country have uh, started to realize the military is common enemy and we must defeat the military. Basically, we must be able to dismantle current current the military institutions which have been in control uh full or or um, part in part for six seven decades and they are the main um sources of many atrocities to the um economic poverty to the uh, uh the situations in general in the country the repressive uh, military institutions. So that's the common understanding. Then uh, once we are able to dismantle the current mil military institution, then there will be a political negotiation. And uh, it is already happening among the different uh, diverse uh, political actors and ethnic groups. And, and then we will have a security sector reform that will include the reformations of the military. At the same time, the current revolution what we have also been witnessing is that the young people of Burma, especially the Burman young people, are not only talking about military dictatorship at this point and reinstating or replacing a new form of government, but we are talking about um, the, the eliminations or ending all form of dictatorships. So not just the military dictatorship. So it's the revolution, we call it. It's not just about fight against the military. It's the fight against ideology um, around the authoritarianisms or all forms of this dictatorship. So young people are committed to really building a true um, democratic values, um, inclusive democracy, uh, federal democracy that assure um, equality and justice and peace for every co communities and individuals in Burma. Um, so, you know, that include, uh, for for instance, the gender equality and in patriarchy and, and so on. So that's why I think for me, um, I'm very optimistic um, in a way how far we are able to come and how far we, um, we can uh, uh, actually go uh, for the for the future of the country, it's not just about the political actors that are important in finding uh, solutions in Burma, but also young people, the younger uh, generations of this country who are committed to build a new future for all of us. Yeah, no, I mean, <clears throat> for people again who who don't follow us closely, I mean, you're describing a much more radical um, and I think necessary transition to an inclusive society. Then the the past transition to democracy or partial democracy was essentially the military maintained a lot of power and made kind of a deal with Aung San Suu Kyi and her political party to relinquish some of that power, but it didn't kind of entrench this uh, military hold on a lot of the society and economy or um, or the kind of Buddhist nationalism that was evident in the ethnic cleansing of the Rohingya that that you have represented um, as an activist. 
Um, so that that does speak to a moment in which the ambition uh, in response to the coup has actually gotten greater uh, with respect to democracy. Uh, I'm interested in in the situation for the Rohingya. Um, uh, nobody suffered more uh, over the years in, in Myanmar than than your community. Um, first of all, uh, how do uh, do you find that there's a greater um, uh, inclusivity of Rohingya in this vision of a future of Myanmar? Um, uh, and and how much of your community remains inside those borders versus how much is in Bangladesh and in in other countries? Yeah, right now. There are about 600,000 uh, Rohingya remain in uh, Myanmar, inside Myanmar, across different um, uh, cities in Rakhine states. Uh, specifically, uh, there are about 130,000 internally displaced Rohingya in Sidwe, Chaokyu, and a few other cities. And outside, um, in, in Bangladesh, there are approximately 1 million Rohingya in, living in mostly squalid refugee camps. And there are several hundred thousands in other, uh, other countries uh, like um, Saudi Arabia, Malaysia, uh, Indonesia, uh, India, Pakistan, um, and Thailand and other neighboring countries. People are risking their life and to take this um, very dangerous journey to, to, to find a safe haven. And uh, the UNHCR actually uh, said um, that in their report, 2023 was the deadliest year of the Rohingya Sea crossing. So that's the situations on the ground. And now uh, with everything happening, uh, besides the humanitarian crisis and catastrophe, in the political discussions and political uh, future, where is Rohingya lies? Yeah. Um, I do believe that um, the Rohingya, unless, until, unless we're able to secure equality and future for the Rohingya community in Burma, which is one of the most persecuted and the most, as you mentioned, uh, the community that suffered the most. If we're not able to protect them, if we're not able to secure future for the Rohingya community and equality and equal rights of Rohingya, uh, we, I, um, I don't think we'll be able to uh, find a peaceful future or democratic future that uh, all of us, uh, the entire country is envisioning. For the Rohingya, it is not just that they lost um, the political rights and and uh, basics human rights in Burma for over the past decade, but also it's all uh, it, 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 they become actually uh, the victims and survivors of serious international crimes uh, such as uh, uh, genocide and crimes against humanity, as as was. Um, uh, acknowledged by the UN and as well as the US government. Um, so I think that when we uh, find solution for the Rohingya, when we have political discussions around the Rohingya, it's not, we have to figure out, to, we have to actually pursue two parts. One, uh, political dialogues and political dis discussions. How do we integrate, reintegrate Rohingya into the Burmese society and assure equal rights, um, including the political rights, which we already had in the past. At the same time, how do we bring justice and accountability and how do we uh, repair the harm that has been done to the Rohingya community? So last question here. I mean, you paint a picture of, of both really dire circumstances for people and violence and atrocities being committed. Uh, and at the same time, there's some hope in the sense that you have this uh, unity among different forces and this progress that's been made in fighting back. Um, the last question I want to ask is, what, what should external countries be doing? That uh, you know, The United States, obviously, what, what policies would you like to see the United States pursue? Um, and I know also the, the Southeast Asian countries, ASEAN, the block of Southeast Asian countries, is, is a key actor. What would you like to see from foreign governments uh, that could help push this in the right direction? There are many, many ways that the U.S. government and ASEAN, um, the country in the regions, can actually uh, support the Burma. Uh, one, um, the uh, neighboring countries uh, should basically uh, provide the people of Burma with more protections and more uh, sustainable path until we are able to go back to Burma. Um, the situations in Bangladesh is so dire. The the conditions in the camps become um, extremely concerning over the past several uh, uh, years. And the situations in Thailand, there is no, 
it's, it's been extremely difficult for the Burmese diaspora and refugees in Thailand to obtain any kind of um, documentations or to be legal to be able to remain in, in Thailand for for uh, in the meantime for a while until we're able to go back. So, you know, all of these neighboring countries are very important for us. We People of uh, Burma need their support at this point. And, um, and the last thing we'd like to see is they engaging with the junta and legitimizing junta's power because that will not resolve crisis in Burma. Uh, that will only empower the junta and exacerbate and um, prolong the military dictatorship and prolong the humanitarian crisis. And what we want to see from the U.S. is U.S. working with this um, strategically important country for the for, for Bur people of Burma and um, listen to our demands. There are so many of them, including now that, that Thailand is trying to uh, do uh, the humanitarian corridor uh, through the Myanmar Red Cross, which is under control of military. We're saying that Thailand shouldn't do it because it is uh, con the Myanmar Red Cross is controlled by the uh, under the um, the hunters authorities. Instead, Thailand should uh, work with the um, civil society and and stakeholders on the ground, including ethnic lead arms organizations and ethnic political organizations, to be able to provide um, the humanitarian assistance to uh, people who need it. And when it's come to the uh, Rohingya refugees, and um, there hasn't been any, any coordinated or collaborated effort to uh, provide protections yeah. to address the boat crises, and 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 I think there should be a lot more could be done. The, the the a lot more could be done on in this regard. There should be um a coordinated effort uh to do search and rescue uh missions uh when when necessary and to provide necessary uh protections and 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 safety procedures to the refugees. And right now, I mean, U.S. have done actually a lot, and we acknowledge that. There has been a lot of sanctions in the past several years uh, since the coup. Uh, the um, and now that we're looking for a more uh, effective and coordinated actions, uh, sanctions are around aviation fuel and supply chain area around the aviation fuel, as well as um, the um, helping the Rohingya. We want to see a UN Security Council resolutions under Chapter Seven. Which um which is binding and enforceable and uh, which include addressing uh, the justice and accountability and in impunity and prosecutions of the serious uh, crimes that military has committed. So, you know there are the there are there are a lot of a lot of things that can be done and we are uh, talking about it engaging with the U.S. government, but we like to see a more rigorous and um and and coordinated actions on Myanmar as US is very important country for us. Mm -hmm. Well look that uh that that's a great uh update on on a lot of dimensions of this. Um so we appreciate it. Uh, we'll be following this going forward and uh appreciate all of your activism on this uh, over the years. It's it's good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope this is helpful and hope to see you again. Thanks again to YY New for joining the show. Thanks to Ona for talking with us again about the ICJ. It's good to have smart friends yeah. you can just reach out to. Yeah, no, we got, uh, we're building a, a roster of them. You know. Can you explain this wildly complicated thing to me in a minute and a half or less? Yeah, sure. better, better than I ever better could. Better than I ever could after yeah. years of learning. Thanks to Men at Work. Um, yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, don't punch anybody. That's all we got. It's a good rule. And don't go to any, you know, Davos and whatever. Uh, yeah, see at the, uh, see in uh, Riyadh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right, that's it for us. Uh, talk to you soon. Let's do it. What are we doing? Yes. <laughs> we know you may be feeling a little stressed about politics right now, so uh, we wanted to offer a practical, hopeful guide to make sure that you're ready for the 2024 election and the 2025 insurrection. That's why we wrote a book called Democracy or Else, How to Save America in 10 Easy Steps. It's a helpful illustrated guide with 100% perfect jokes, but maybe reading isn't your thing. Maybe the lore of a reasonable page count loaded with illustrations isn't enough to move the needle. That's fine. That's right, we hunkered down for what was, let's be honest, a tedious eight hours we'll never get back to bring you Democracy or Else as an audiobook. Finally, your chance to listen to the three of us talk about politics. 
What a rare opportunity. <laughs> Perfect for the avid listener who loves the pod, but just wishes it was much, much longer. And people who don't read, like me. Right. Yeah, illiterate people. I like to listen to things. Functionally so... illiterate people. <laughs> <laughs> We're really selling it. So, <laughs> <laughs> Boy, am I going to click? Hey, buy. don't break your phones clicking purchase. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually great. Every Republican that gets some ghostwriter to throw a couple words on a page is on the bestseller list. Why can't it be us? <laughs> Why not us? Yeah. Why is it always Bill O'Reilly? Killing yeah. some historical figure. I know you're all excited to pre-order now. You can go to crooked.com slash books. Pre-order your copy today.